Hello and welcome to Climbing the Interface Ladder Lecture Number One Inventories and Interfaces. So, a new course, a new, um, well, new ton of possibilities. So, this course will teach you about how to set up um, interfaces, obviously, but in this first um, lecture, we'll also take a look on how we can work with inventories because they are very um, much connected with the interfaces. When we have an inventory, we want to store items. We might want to render them, and so on. So a few a uh, few practical informations first. So um, to take this course, you're assumed to know Java. You're assumed to know object-oriented Java, and you're also assumed to know how to make a Minecraft mod. If you've taken the three previous courses, you should be all right. In the end of the course, we will have an assignment, that's the examination for the course, uh, which basically, well, includes, um, um, well, a little task. You're supposed to write a simple mod, working a bit with interfaces to prove that you've learned what's going on in the course. And if you pass it, if you, if you manage to write the assignment properly, then you will pass the course, and that's it, basically. If, well, if you hand in the assignment and it's not all right, then I will tell you so, give you some feedback, and you can just fix that and hand it in again. After each lecture, there will be a document, the questions and exercises document, which you can take a look on to, well, answer the questions just to see if you uh, you have understood what you well what you've been hearing during the lecture, and then you can also uh, do the exercises to practice what you've learned as well. But those are completely optional, even though I recommend them. So you don't hand them in; you have the um, you have the um, answers in the end of the document. So let's get started. So. What I have here is, um, well, the mod from the last course. I've renamed it to Steve's Interfaces rather than Steve's Example. But apart from that, it's pretty much the same. If you didn't take the previous course, you can download the source code of this from, from um, well, the end of the last course. So the last lecture of the last course has all the source code because I'm using the same as before, but without further ado, let's get started with some interfaces. Okay, uh, here we go, client here. I'm going to create a um, package, so just head into this right away, um, called interfaces, and this is where the magic is going to happen later on. So, um, here we go, just add a lot of things there, but I'm actually not going to work with that right away. We want in an inventory first. So what I'm going to do is create an inventory uh, for the um, the block that I had last course. I had a block, a machine block, which dropped anvils from the uh, air uh, when you stepped on it or if you gave it a redstone signal and so on. So um, what we I want to do is give it an inventory so we have to supply it with anvils to drop. So what we want to head over is create a tile entity. To make an inventory for a block, what we need is a tile entity. So a tile entity, we, well, because we need extra information, um, entity. we c can just store like 16 values in a normal block without a tile entity. Uh, so it will be kind of tricky to save all the items. Here we go. And what we want to do is two things. First, of course, we want to extend tile entity like so. And the second thing we want to do is implement I inventory. So by doing this part there, if we import Control Shift O, uh, by doing that part, we tell this: this is an inventory. This tile entity is an inventory. Anything can be an inventory in Minecraft. We can have entities that are inventories. For instance, a cart with a sh with chests. Then that one is an inventory. Here, in this case, we have a tile entity that is an inventory. So that's the first step. But before continuing there, we need to implement a ton of methods. That's why it's complaining here. Um, so before doing that, I'm going to head over to the um, to the block, the machine uh, block that we had here. And just to make sure that everything works. So, because we have a tile entity, we want to extend block container instead. And then we want to head over to, uh, well, we can ask it to implement that. So, we need this method here because we have a block container. So, that's the uh, create new tile entity one. And obviously, we need to return 
new tile entity uh, machine. There you go. Import that as well. Right. And when that's done, okay. All right. I haven't saved this. There you go. Now it's working better. And finally, we need to register this tile entity. Um, if the clip finishes its loading process, uh, so we head over to blocks and do the registration here. So game registry tile in entity tile entity machine dot class, and then we need a name for all well, a key sort of what we should register it as, and well. Let's define something called that. So machine tile entity key. But like I said, that doesn't exist. So uh, let's create this here. And put it uh, together with the other machine stuff. There you go. Um, so now that it has been registered like that. So Hopefully this shouldn't be anything new because you're supposed to know about tile entities. So the only thing I've done now is create a tile entity for the block machine, but the special part is that I have told it to implement I inventory, and that basically means we want an inventory. This tile entity should be a inventory rather than uh, uh, well something else. But it's still a tile entity, so uh, we can still do all the normal stuff there. So Obviously, we we have a ton of methods inside our inventory that we need to implement, and by a ton, I mean well, twelve. So that's quite a lot, actually. So I'm just going to ask Eclipse to implement all of these. So as you can see, there are a bunch of them. So we need to implement these properly to make this a proper inventory. And I'm going to start at the bottom here and implement a few, and then I'm going to implement some at the top as well. So well. Let's let's get started, shall we? So is stack valid for or well is item valid for slot, sorry. Um it's quite an easy one here. And what I'm gonna do is um um return item stack. So that's the item stack here. I want to return if this item stack is valid at a specific location. Um and I get this I ID. And then I check that that ID is the same ID as the uh block ID of an anvil. So that's fairly simple. If I want to do something more advanced, I can use this I here to, to define it differently for different slots. But basically what I want to tell it is, well, if you want to put something in this inventory, then it has to have the same ID as an anvil. Or, well, in other words, it has to be an anvil. Then we uh, can use this closed chest. And to be honest, I'm not sure why these are here at all. These are used specifically by um, by a chest that is supposed to be opened, like the lid is supposed to be opened and closed. So there's no reason at all to have them in our inventory, but they are there, so we ha have to obey and use them, but we don't have to add any content to them. So we don't need those. It's usable by player, um, so when is this usable by the player? Well, um, normally what you want to do is check that you're close enough. So if someone pushes you away, if you activate this block and falls down into a pit, you shouldn't still be able to interact with it and, and get items from it. So um, what I'm going to do here is get a player, entity player like so, and get distance so we get the distance to, to this block. But like I've discussed in the end of la the last course, there's no reason to just get the distance. It's just much faster to get the distance squared. So we're going to get the distance squared and we're going to do so to the middle of um, we don't need that. Oops. Uh, to the middle of this block. Um, like that. Okay, and we want to make sure that that is less than 64. And that's just a matter of making sure that you can interact with this uh, this inventory. So if you're too far away, you can't. For instance, if a cart sips along with a chest and you interact with it, and then it goes away, you won't be able to interact with it anymore when it's too far away. The uh, interface will close and everything. Right. Um, get inventory stack limit, that's a fairly simple one. Uh, 
return 64. That means that the slots that we do have here, we don't want them to be able to have stacks larger than 64. And more often than not, you're just going to set this to 64 like that. So th this was a few, uh, or a few different methods, um, and I'm going to jump up here. We'll we'll see later on the rest of the methods. But we what we want to do now is actually create somewhere to store items. So how do we do that? Well, that's up to us entirely. We we implement our inventory, but that doesn't mean that it forces us to do something specific. The only specific it forces us to do is implement these these twelve different methods or override these twelve different methods. And what would make sense is probably having a um, an array here of uh, of item stack. So an item stack array called items. There you go. Okay. What does this mean? Well, that means that we have an array of items that we can store. So public tile entity machine is the constructor there. And what we can do is set it like this. Item uh, stack. And which size do I want to have? Well, I want to have a size of three. So I want three items to be stored in this inventory. That's totally fine. We could have one if we wanted to. We could have zero. We could have four. We can have, well, any amount of items, really. Um, so what I'm going to do now is just use this uh, items array uh, to, well, override these last methods. So, so here we need to tell it how large is this inventory. And it's fairly simple because we have an array. So we can just return items.length. There you go. So it knows how large this inventory is. That can change if we want to, but... Uh, but it well, yes, return the length of the array and get stack in slot. We need to return a stack in a specific slot, and we can do that as well fairly easily. It, we just return items and I like that, so we get the index like so, and then we return the uh, it's like that. So, so we just need to get the stack in a specific slot, and well, that's how we do it. Now it gets a bit more advanced. Now we want to be able to decrease a stack in a slot. So maybe we, um, here we have the counts, maybe we have like, oh well in stack 2 I want to remove 3 items for instance. So how do we do that? Well, first of all it makes sense to actually check what we have in that slot specifically. Like this. We just used the get stack in slot method that we had from up here. There we go. Um, but what we want to do is, in the end we want to return we want to return the item that we, uh, well, basically removed. So if we, we try to remove three items, because we have this as three, then we want to get a stack back with three items. Um, but we only want to get that um, as, as three items uh, if we actually could rem can remove three items. If we just manage to remove two items, then we should only get two back. So what we, we should do is um, uh, return it like this. So item stack, uh, uh, let's see. Yeah, so I'm just going to return the item stack here. You will see why. And we want to check if it's not null. So if the item stack happens to be null, then we obviously can't remove anything, and therefore we will just return the item stack right away with null there. Um, so that's that part. But if it's not null, that means that we can extract something. And uh, well, item stack dot stack size. So if the stack size is lesser than or equals to to the count we want to remove, that means that we can remove everything. So what we want to extract is exactly everything from this slot because well, we want to remove the exa same amount that we have, or we want to remove even more. So if that's the case, then this item stack here is going to be the um, the thing we actually want to re remove, because we got it all and we removed it all. So the only thing we want to do is actually remove the item from the slot itself. So what we can do there is use called set inventory slot contents, more to that in, in a bit, and we set that to null. That's the only thing we want to do. So we have got a stack, we decrease it by removing it completely, and then we return it. However, if we don't want to remove it all, you know, because, well, 
the account is uh, well lesser than the amount we actually have, then we want to do it a bit differently. What we want to do is split the stack in two. We want to get a specific amount and then we want to leave the rest. And what we can do is the following code. Like that. So what split stack is going to do is it's going to extract a stack of the, this specific size. So if this item stack that we did have had, for instance, five items, then we want to extract two, then the old item stack will have three items left, where, where the new item stack will have two items. So we just grab the amounts of items we want and, uh, well, using this method here, it's going to remove them from the old item stack. And since I'm putting that in item stack now, when we return it in the end, we will return whatever we, we extracted from the inventory. What we also want to do here is just tell it that the inventory has been changed. The reason why I don't do that up here is because set inventory slot contents is going to do that as well. So we already do that once. So now we have get stack in slot to just get it, get it. And we also have decrease stack in slot. I'm going to pass over this one just now and take a look on this, set inventory slot contents. And what this is, uh, it's fairly simple. Basically what it means is, well, we use it there, but what it means is, well, at this coordinate here, set this item stack as the current item. And what we want to do is, um, well, this is the, well, logic part, so items i equals item stack. That's the only part, really, that matters. And that's the important part, but we might want to do a few other things, like, all right, uh, on inventory change, this inventory did change. Um, maybe we want to do something when that happens, so that's why we have it. Uh, and another thing that we might want to do, uh, which you can question if we actually do need, um, but it might be important in other cases, so I'm just going to add it. And that is, if we actually set it to a proper item, and the item that we set it to is bigger than the uh, inventory stack limit, then we might want to change the stack size. But since we're having the stack size of 64 as our limit, it might seem a bit ridiculous to actually do this check. So it's not that important if you have it as 64. But if you have it as lower, then, then it's important so you can't set more, um, more items in one stack there inside the inventory. So this is the m very important part, that we actually set the item. And then we have that one and this one, which is, well, not as important, but it's still good to have them there. So we want to set it like so. So what is this get stack in slot on closing? Well, it's basically get stack in slot. It's the same thing. But what we want to do here is when we're closing, like we're closing the, the inventory uh, for some reason, then we might want to clear it as well. So what this is going to do, get stack in slot, is first going to get the stack at that specific location. We're going to return that as well. But before we return it, we're just going to uh, uh, remove it from the inventory itself. So this is basically a, a method that does two calls. So it gets the, the content, but it also removes the content. Uh, so instead of just getting it, we actually extract it completely. So those are those two, and then we have these two guys left, and well, these are fairly new what, what they are used for, but basically, um, in vanilla nowadays, you can sort of change the name of tile entities and change the name of, of entities, so you could change the name of, I don't know, a furnace, I guess, and call it Bobby, and then you may, might want to uh, have that in the inventory, so, well, the interface says Bobby instead of furnace. Uh, and that's basically what these two are. So if we have set this is in name localized to true, then the name that we return here is going to, well, be a proper uh, localized name. But that doesn't mean that it's going to say that in our inventory or interface or anything. We still have to. Uh, that's not to spell Bobby. Um, but we still we still need to use it. It's it's not going to be automatic or anything. So so. I'm not entirely sure why you would want to do things like this. Um, so I'm just going to, uh, well, ignore that. So I'm going to set that to false, and therefore this is going to be an, uh, well, the sort of unlocalized name, and we're not really going to use that. But we have to specify that. Um, so, well, that's how it is. 
We might take a look a further look on these later, but I don't think so. So there we go. Now we have an inventory. We have implemented I inventory and we have overridden all these twelve methods properly. So there you go, an inventory. But it's not going to do much. Uh, we won't be able to well add any items to it or anything. Yes, because well, you know, we don't have an interface. So how do we do that? How do we fix an interface? Well, I'm going to head over to um, uh, where that is to the to the package here that I created and start creating a few things. Here you go. Um, and what I'm going to start with is the actual interface. We're going to need multiple things. We need more things than just the actual interface. Um, but what I'm going to start with is a GUI machine here. Like that. And what we want that is to extend, well, we have a few different things we can extend. We can ha extend GUI, we can ex extend GUI screen, or what I recommend is GUI container. And that is specifically made for, well, uh, GUIs that can store items and use use some something called a container. We will take a look on that later, oh, uh, which you can use even um, if you're not storing any items. But if you store items, it's almost necessary to have a GUI container. Um, so just import that, and we need a um, constructor, and we need a uh, this method here. So what are these two things? Well, this is basically the part where we draw things, and this is just a constructor, but I'm not going to use the parameters it supplies us with here. You'll see later on what I'm going to use instead. Um, so for now, I'm just going to leave that empty, and it's going to complain because I don't do a proper super core, but we're going to leave it like that for now. What we want to do, however, is set the size. And I'm going to set that to, oops, 176, 154. And this size here is the size of the texture that I have. And I can take a look on that. So here we go in my MCP folder, renamed to Steve's Interfaces. If I go into Source, Minecraft, Assets, Example, uh, Textures, GUI, like that, I have this uh, texture sheet here called machi Machine. It's very simple, machine.png. And the file itself has to be 256 by 2 fix. So 256 pixels by 256 pixels. But I don't have my interface as the whole part there. I want to define how big is the actual interface itself. And in this case, it happens to be 176 times 154. So that's what I define it as. OK, so that's one step. But like I've said, we haven't supplied the superclass with a proper superclass call there. But we're going to do that in a bit. What we want to do next is the following. Private, static, final resource location texture calls new resource location um, I will go through this uh, in just a second Just let me finish it machine.png okay so what I have here if I import it is something called a resource location and one thing worth mentioning is in recent, um, first of all, in recent uh, Minecraft Forge version uh, versions, it has been changed where you can find it. Uh, it used to be on the client side only. Now it's on everything. And speaking of which, uh, we should uh, we should do a side only here uh, to tell it that we only have this interface on the client side. So if you're in a newer version. Uh, well, not in a new version. In an older version, you might fin find this in a different location, and that might cause problems. So, um, uh, I recommend you to update. And that's what I've done. I'm not using the same version that I did in the last course, and the reason is to make these resource locations work properly. But apart from that, it's pretty much the same. And what a resource location is, is basically a... Um, um, well, a... Um, well, a location of our resource, our texture. So we define it as being an um, example here. That means that we want to put it in the example here, in this example folder, if you take a look there. 
or so there example and then we need to specify the full path so compared to uh, like block icons and item icons we ne actually need to specify the full path in the for the icons we have specified the name so that we just specify machine here but here we can just specify where we want it to be but don't put the example here so we do like example and then um, like that and then remove this part because then it's going to assume that you want to put it together with the Minecraft uh, vanilla textures. So put the example of whatever you want to use uh, that we used for the icon zone here as the first parameter and then use the fill path fr from within that folder uh, as the second parameter. So that's just how we specify where we can find the uh, the texture. So now it's a matter of drawing the interface and inside this method we will do a ton of things to make neat uh, well textures and so on in the future but for now it's going to be fairly simple we need to start somewhere so what I'm going to do is first of all this thing here so gl11 dot gl color uh, color for f uh, one, 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 one. There you go. So what this means is, well, basically I'm, re I'm resetting the colors just to make sure that we're not having some specific color when we draw this uh, texture. If, if we have, uh, maybe everything is going to be too dark, maybe everything is going to be too red, maybe everything is going to be, well, too bright. Well, it can't be too bright. But uh, basically I'm just resetting the colors so we will draw it in the colors we have defined in the texture then the second part what we need to do is to bind a texture and by binding a texture we're basically setting it as the current one and well I'm sorry but the methods for doing that is very badly named because they haven't been named yet basically so um, what I want here is func uh, 11 0434k and then I want func underscore 110577a and then the texture. So it might be tricky to remember these and the reason is because they haven't been named, they are new. This this thing with resource locations are new for 1.6 point uh, well, 1.6 basically, before it used a similar system. You had a, tex a texture path and then you, um, you know, uh, uh, loaded that texture as well. But it works a bit differently now. We have a resource location instead and then we bind that one. So what we want to do here is minecraft.get minecraft.func underscore 110343434 uh, underscore k dot funk underscore one one oh five seven seven underscore a and then the texture and these will obviously be named to like get render engine and bind texture or something like that later on but for now they are called uh, uh, called that so that's what we'll have to live with uh, so that's step two step three is to draw something so now we have have said which uh, texture is the current one so now it's just a matter of of drawing it so draw textured uh, model Rect. There you go. So we want to draw a, a rectangle from the texture. And to do so, we need to specify, as we can see here, four different parameters. Four, I can't count, six, of course. And all of these are integers. And the first, uh, so we have them in pair. So here we have one pair, here we have one, and here we have one. We'll, we'll see why. I have grouped them in pairs. So the first one is where we want to draw this. And you might think, well, the interface, well, we should start at, at zero, 00, that's the top left, right. And that's, well, sort of true. But that will put it all the way up into the upper left corner of your screen. And you don't want that. You want it to be centered in your screen, right? Uh, the interface should be in the middle of the screen. So what we'll have to do is tell it, well, we should have it at zero, 00, but we should increase it by an amount that puts it in the center. And we don't have to calculate that ourselves, because we have set how big it is, it can calculate this for us. So the only thing we can uh, have to do is like GUI left uh, GUI top. If you, for instance, want to draw something five pixels from the left uh, uh, to the right of this, sorry, we can do, for instance, GUI left plus five, and we will see how we can do these things uh, better later on. But for now, um, yes, we're going to draw this only texture, this only rectangle at the very top left of the interface, and not the screen. The second uh, pair here is to define where in the texture you want to draw uh, from. And since we 
since the texture, this is the big background, it starts at zero, 0, it's just the top left. So that depends on where we put our texture in our texture file. And for me, I that started at zero, 0, because the texture file start, um, well, I start drawing the texture at the very top left, and then I just expand it. So, first of all, we have the destination, where we should put it. Then we have the source, where we can find it. And finally, we have the size. And we already specified the size here because, well, we had to. So we can just use that like so. There we go. So obviously, this is just one rectangle. And we will see later on how we can make a lot of rectangles working together to make things look neat. But for the moment, the only thing we're actually going to use here is this thing here. We're going to make sure that the color is reset. Then we're going to bind the texture. And finally, we're going to draw this texture like so. There you go. But we still haven't figured out this thing up here. But, well, we'll take a look on that in a minute. So what I want to do is, oops, create another class here. Class. And what we want to have here is container machine. Okay. So we have a GUI container, so we obviously need a container as well. But what is a container here? Well, these containers are... Um, well, sort of a, a helper thingy to the interface, something that helps um, us control the interface a bit. When we open an interface, we will actually do that on the server side. So the server will start the interface and tell the client to show it. And the server will run this container of sorts, and the client will run both. So the client will run both the container and the interface. And this container, we can use it for a few different things. We'll see how we can use that to control the, the interface a bit uh, with, um, um, well, with, with, with the inventory, with slots and so on. We'll take a look on that. We can also use it to synchronize some data properly. So basically what it is, is something that exists on both sides, both the uh, server and the client. And on the server side, we have one container each time someone opens. Uh, interface. We will take a closer look later on. Uh, we'll see how we can improve this container. But for now, I'm just going to set up a very simple uh, one, so we can use it. But but we will see if uh, further on into the um, into the lecture and the t into the course actually what this container can actually do for us. It's pretty powerful. And the only method that we do have to override here is, well, it can interact with. So if a player can interact with it. But that's not the only thing I want. I want a constructor here, container machine. And what I want to do here is have an inventory player. So that's not the player, that's the inventory of a player. So like I said, uh, we, we can have entities being inventories. We can have, um, well, Talent is being inventory, and we can have whatever we want being an inventory. So the player actually has a specific object that is the inventory itself. So it's not the player that stores items, even though that would be possible. It's the uh, uh, this inventory player that stores it for us. And then I also want the machine, NTT machine that this is uh, connected to. Well, a part of. And what I'm going to do here is very simple. We'll see after the break um, how we can um, use this properly. So we'll just make like a shell here to start with. What I'm going to do is just store which machine we have here. And when we want to see if we can interact with this, we just return uh, machine dot is uh, usable by player. Remember, we defined that um, earlier in this lecture. Basically, if the square distance is less than 64, then it was possible. So we can just use the same. There you go. So for now, it might be a bit tricky to know what we should have this for. But like I said, after the break, we'll take a closer look on what we can do with this. We need a container, and it should be a bit more advanced than what we have here. But um, well, like I said, we we'll take a look on that. But what we're going to do now is actually specify the same parameters here that when we create the inventory. So we want the inventory of the player and we also want the tile entity machine. So we want the machine itself. And the only reason why I want those two is so I can do the super call with a new container machine here. Um, and what I'm going to do here is in player machine. 
So what I'm doing here is creating a new container and giving it to the uh, uh, super, super class there. So the GUI container, the only thing it cares about is that we give it a container, but we're going to take one player and one machine and then create a new container machine. So like I said, if we have an interface, we're going to have an underlying container to help us uh, um, with that. But like I also said, it might be um, annoying, but we'll take a closer look on what we can do with the container in just a bit. So now we have the container and the GUI. What we want to do is to sort of link these together to tell, to tell, uh, well, the Minecraft how to open these two. And what we need is a class for that. Um, where is it? No, I haven't created that yet. A class here called GUI Handler. We don't have to call it that, of course, but I think that makes sense. Um, and the important part here is that we do implement I GUI Handler. So what this is going to specify um, is a few different things. Um, we had get server GUI element and get client GUI element. So here we're going to sort of specify what elements we're going to use when we're displaying interfaces. And that's basically why it's an iGUI handler, like so. But one thing I want to do here before I implement this properly is create a constructor, like this. So uh, uh, no, I don't want anything there. So what I want to do is um, register this GUI handler because we need to register it so it knows about this handler so we can use it basically. And we do it like this: the network registry uh, dot instance dot register GUI handler. It's this one here. And what we need to give it is two things: we need to give it the handler itself and the mod. The handler itself is easy. That's just this object here. Uh, refer to that by this, and the mod is fairly simple as well. That just these interfaces dot instance, like so. Sweet. Um, then what do we want to return here? Well, like I said, on the client side we have both a container and a interface. On the service side we have only the container. So what we want to do is return the uh, container here and we want to return the interface here. If we return the interface, we create a new interface. Then if we take a look here, we're going to create a container as well. So we get both. So in the end, if we return a container on the server side and an interface on the client side, we will get all the things we need. Okay. So how do we do this? Well, it's quite easy actually. So we get an ID here. We will see exactly what that is, but I'm going to do a switch here. Uh, return null if if it didn't go all right, and if we have case zero, so if we have the sort of the first ID, I guess. Um, then what we want to do is tile NDT TE like so. So we want to get a tile entity from from the world because we will get a world and a position here x y and c. So we can just do get block tile entity x y and c like so. Yeah, I can import that. If t is not equal to no, and t instance of tile entity machine. There you go. So what we want to do now is simply return a new container. So return new container machine. And what we want to give it is obviously a player inventory and a machine because that's how we define it. And we can get the player inventory by referring to the player. He has to do inventory here. And then the second part is to do tile, tile entity uh, machine and give it the tile entity like so. So now what we're doing here is basically um, how many error here? Uh, sorry. There you go. Um, is we're creating a new container and we give that to the server. But we also need to give something to the client. And that's going to be the exact same thing actually. Um, so if I just do switch ID like this. So I'm, I'm going to go through this quite quickly. I think. So I uh, get the tile entity. There you go, X, Y, C. And we want to check that that's not no, and that that is the correct type. Uh, 
entity machine like so and then when we have that we want to return a new uh, GUI machine player dot inventory tile entity machine and then the tile entity like so. So as you can see now on the client side we return the GUI on the server side we return the container and that's everything we need. So we define that on the server we do it like this we define that on the client side we do it like this and well if we don't we need to create a new GUI handler but if we do then we're done so I'm going to head over to the mod itself and in the load here I can just create a new GUI handler there we go okay uh, import that. So what do we have? Well, we create a new GUI handler. The GUI handler is specifying what to open uh, depending on something called an ID of some sort. We don't know what that ID is yet, but we also get the player, the world, and, and the coordinates. And we're having one container and one GUI. So the container is this container here. At the moment we're not doing a lot here. After the break we'll take a closer look on that one. And in the GUI we're going to do these things. So we load a texture, uh, we bind that texture when we draw things, and then we draw that there. We're going to improve this a lot in later lectures, but this is actually everything for now. We just get a texture um, texture sheet and draw the full um, um, interface from there. And basically that's it. We have an interface, we have a container, we have a GUI handler, and we need to tell it to show the interface. So that's the only thing left. So how do we do that? Well, let's head over to block machine here. And at the moment when it's being activated, we do this thing. If you t took the last course, you know that, well, we tell if it's uh, disabled or not. Um, but I'm just going to skip this code uh, completely for now. We're going to re-implement it later on, uh, being controlled uh, through the interface. But for now, we want to open this text, or well, not text, this interface, sorry. Uh, what I'm going to do here is uh, fml uh, net network handler dot open GUI. We need to give it the player that we have there, the world, the x, y, and c, and the only parts left are this mod, so we need to tell it Steve's interfaces dot instance, and finally an ID. So when I give it the Steve's interfaces here, it's going to match that with the mod we're registering it with. So since we have the same mod here, we know that when we do that call with Steve's interfaces over here, it's going to find the GUI handler that has been registered for this mod, which is this one, the GUI handler. And since we give it the ID 0 here, that means that we have interface number 0, and therefore what it's going to do is, well, find that part and that part. So we can just have multiple cases here if we want to have multiple interfaces. We shouldn't have multiple um, GUI handlers, we can only have one per mod. So that's about it. We open it wherever we want to call that open thing, but we do that on the server side. Don't do it on the client side, do it on the server side. Believe it or not, interfaces are open from the server side, then the server will tell the client to show the textures. Um, and then on the server side we just get the container, so the controlling container there, close a look later, whereas on the client we create a new interface and the interface will create a new container. So we have the container on both ends. But we don't have the interface parts, the one with texture on the client side. So that's sort of how you set up uh, a texture, well, an interface. Or we need the interface itself, we need a container, we need a handler, but the handler we only have one of, we don't have one per per interf uh, interface, so if we have multiple interfaces just have one handler, and then we just call that with the network handler instead. So here we go, um, uh, grab a machine here, like so, if I right click, boom, I get the texture. Well, we have some problems here, we, uh, well, I can't see that I have this in my inventory, I can't do anything in this. And that's because, well, I have an inventory in this. This machine block here has an inventory. This silly machine has an inventory. And I do have an interface for it. But these two things are not connected to each other. So after the break, we'll take a look how we can connect this and how we can make this inventory work properly. It has some flaws because, well, we are not done yet. But like I said, that's after the break. I'll see you in about 15 minutes.